What are the differences between coins that seem to do the same thing? Tokenomics is a way of looking at how a token creates and sustains its value in the blockchain ecosystem. Of course, this is a result of a ton of factors, so we're going to cover the major ones in this two-part series. Hopefully these videos will give you some idea of what to look for when you're interested in a new project. When you're looking for information like this, remember that a project's white paper is the best place to start. If a project doesn't have a white paper or any kind of technical information available, that's a red flag. So let's get started. It's best to start at the very beginning. Where did the coin come from? Take Bitcoin, for example. Bitcoins are generated every time a block is mined, and there's a hard cap on the total number that will ever exist. This makes the coin more scarce, and as such more valuable than a coin generated from thin air. Many projects will pre-mine the sum total of all the coins that will ever be on the network and then release them slowly over time to users. Or they'll create a large supply for a crowd sale and then continue to generate more through mining on the network. This isn't to say that this approach is wrong or bad, but it's a more difficult route to creating value. Given two equally useful coins, the one with only 1 million in existence will be worth more than the one with 1 billion in existence. So this is important to keep in mind. Is the supply of the token growing or shrinking? And if so, how fast? Another factor in the value coins provide is the method in which it was created. Is it entirely new? Is it a fork of an existing coin? Is it built on top of an existing chain and coin system? All of these avenues have their benefits and drawbacks. A brand new coin has the potential to be anything. With a good team and good marketing, a lot of value can be hyped up around a project that is relatively unknown. If it can deliver on its promises, that bodes well for the value. If it can't, it has little safety net to prevent it from zeroing out. Without the community support of a fork or a chain it's being built on, it lives and dies purely on how well it can prove itself. A fork of an existing coin has the benefit of building off of an infrastructure and community that already exists. This can be good if the fork is something the community has wanted for a long time, as it'll gain a lot of users very quickly. But if it's a contentious fork, the new coin could split the community or even be actively attacked by it. These are all important considerations in a coin's value. Few people purchase a coin they dislike. Similarly, a coin built on top of an existing ecosystem like Ethereum can leverage the same community and developer support that a fork might, but without much of the risk of angering the community by splitting it. Your app simply exists on the chain and people can use it if they find it useful. But coins built on coins tend to face a lot of criticism and have a hard time decoupling or growing beyond its parent currency. You're also at the mercy of the chain that you built on. If a major change in the parent chain destroys your project, there's not much you can do. We can see now that how you generate coins and where you generate coins are important to how the market will value them. One more major facet of the valuation is what type of coins you generate. There's a lot of different types here, but we'll look at the big ones. Is the token fungible or non-fungible? Essentially, is it a currency or is it a collectible? Obviously, any given collectible can be worth much more than one unit of currency. But as the word collectible would imply, there's very few of them. Fungible tokens are prolific, meaning there's often millions of them. They get value from this property because you can reliably trade them with other people for a set price. A non-fungible is the exact opposite. It's rare, so its value is much higher. But at the same time, it's only really worth something to the right person. Is the token a utility or a security? Now we won't go too deep into this here because it's incredibly complex and we already have a guide on this that you should check out. But at the minimum, you should ask yourself this. Does this token allow me to access or use a service that I couldn't otherwise? Does it perform a function? Or is it basically just a token that I'm holding in the hope that it increases in value? This is one of the many determining factors in what is and isn't a security, and the implications of that determination can have an enormous impact on the value of your token. In these early days of blockchain and cryptocurrency regulations, many users are wary of tokens that could be classified as securities as that carries with it major legal and tax ramifications. All of this really encapsulates into a concept called network effect. All of these small decisions we've talked about, and more that we'll talk about in the next part, are little pieces of a puzzle that build up incentives and disincentives for users to participate in your network. Maybe some users are interested purely in Ethereum collectible tokens, maybe others in regulated securities based on Bitcoin forks. The amount of interested users that you capture directly relates to your network's ability to grow and expand. A network with three users on it is easily forgotten or compromised. A network with millions of users is much more difficult to take down and is likely to grow further as those users talk about it. This is your network effect. In the next part, we'll discuss more factors at play in tokenomics that can help you discern for yourself why projects earn the valuations that they do. Hopefully by the end of this series, you'll not only be able to reliably spot strong projects in the space, but explain why they're strong too. In part one, we talked about several of the aspects of token design that impact its value. How it was built, where it was built, what type of token it is, and so on. To finish off our tokenomics discussion, we'll explore a couple of new concepts and how tokens can actually produce different types of value. So after everything from the last video is done, 
the token has been created and distributed in whatever form and function you desire, there are still a few more considerations in how to support the economy of the token as it grows. Token velocity is how often your tokens are moved within the network. A high token velocity often drives down the value of a token, as it is frequently being passed around and liquidated. This does not mean that a high token velocity is bad. It's just a consideration when designing a token ecosystem. If your token is primarily a means of exchange like many cryptocurrencies are, chances are the high token velocity will keep the value relatively low. People typically don't use assets worth thousands of dollars to buy coffee with. They use fast, easy, and low-risk methods. In the past, that's been a physical currency like US dollars. It's prolific and easy to use. It has a high velocity, and each unit or dollar is fairly low in value. The alternative, something with low velocity, would be a store of value like gold. Going to the coffee shop and shaving a piece off your gold bar for a coffee would not only be funny, it would be short-sighted. Gold is held onto because it's rare, it's high in value, and it tends to increase in value. It has a low velocity. So depending on how you want your token to be valued, think about how you can impact your token's velocity. If you want a high-velocity token that makes commerce fast and easy, then that's fantastic. But don't be surprised if its value ends up resting at a fairly low level. Many projects aim to lower their token velocity through concepts like staking or token burn. Staking rewards users for putting their coins in a validation pool. This takes them out of day-to-day -day transaction use and thus reduces the velocity. Token burn can happen a number of ways, but a popular way is to burn a tiny amount of every transaction. In this way, the supply is constantly dropping, meaning with every transaction, the coin gets a tiny bit more rare. In theory, the rarer the token, the more valuable it becomes, and so users are incentivized to hold their tokens. Another factor to consider is the overall distribution of your token. A healthy ecosystem typically has a lot of different token holders with a relatively even distribution of the supply across them. If a large percentage of your token is held by a few people, those people hold a tremendous amount of power in determining its value. If someone with 30% of your total token has decided to begin a huge sell-off, your network's value would plummet. That amount of supply on the market would make your token effectively worthless. Try to look for ways to ensure that your token gets into as many hands as possible. A lot of this boils down to marketing and your ability to get as many people on board with your project as possible. But other methods that can help are airdropping coins to thousands of different users, or hard capping the number of coins you can buy in an ICO sale. All this being said, we can think of the overall value of each token as the sum of two main parts, its intrinsic value and its speculative value. A token's intrinsic value is gained from how well it does what it set out to do. This is tied in to many of the decisions we covered earlier, like if it's a fungible token or not, if it's a utility token or not, is it building off the network effect of another blockchain? So, if you set out to make a currency, is it a currency? Does it function well as a currency? Are people using it? If so, then your token holds some intrinsic value. The system is well designed, people can see that, and so they purchase the token and use it. Speculative value is gained from people who are trying to project the future value of a project or token. This type of value is great if you're looking to make some quick money, but can be hazardous to the well-being of a network. Speculation ties into some of the decisions we made earlier as well. Like are you burning tokens to reduce the supply and increase the demand? Have you generated all the coins that will exist from the start, or will more continue to be produced through mining? Speculative value is partially tied to a token's intrinsic value, but is also tied to economic decisions like these. If your token is inflated by speculative value, you should be prepared to see that value drop significantly when speculators begin to sell off once they get to their preferred profit range. So there you have it, our two-part crash course on tokenomics. Creating the right kind of token is an incredibly complex topic with many different nuances and decisions. We hope this guide served as a good introduction to why token valuations are what they are, and how you yourself can design effective token networks.